Uh, thanks a lot to everyone. Um, I'm going to try to uh, reply a little bit to comment on the thoughts of Cardinal. And I studied in a Jesuit university back in Spain, and we took three years of Catholic social thought. And at this moment, I wish I had paid a little bit more attention, <laughs> because I think that many of the days I may have been following the soccer results a little bit too much. Anyway, so the other day, my wife asked me uh, to clean a little bit my library. And as I was doing that, I found an old copy of Democracy in America by um, Tocqueville, which is this gentleman here in the uh, painting. And I thought, yeah, I read Democracy in America for the first time when I was in my first year in college back in 1990. And now, after having lived in the US 17 years, maybe it will be really interesting to read it again. So I grabbed the copy of the book, I went downstairs, to the total unhappiness of my wife, because that meant I was not going to clean the library anymore, and I started reading the book. And of course, the book is, is really beautiful. I, I think that all of you perfectly know that. But as I started reading it, I found this quote in the preface, which I didn't really remember from what I was uh, reading for the first time. I put the original in French. Uh, as you can imagine, being from Spain, for me it's much easier to read French than English, and then it's my translation down. And Tocqueville is very interested in the preface about the tremendous changes that are happening in the world, in what you know, sometimes people have called the project of modernity since the early Middle Ages, and how democracy is only the culmination of those. And he thinks that studying the United States is important because it shows the future of France itself. And in particular, he wants to build a community and somehow order those changes that were happening in Europe to build a society that will work for the welfare of everyone. And for that, he claims that we need a new political science. He really meant a new social science, more in general, than just as a political science. What did, I, what did I think that this was a good way to start my comments? Well, for two reasons. One, because I fully agree with Tocqueville that we are living in times of very, very deep changes. I will elaborate on that in just one more second, and that we should use the rules of or the teachings of social science to think about uh, those changes. But I also agree with Tocqueville that we want to do it to organize a society that satisfies certain goals that go much more beyond just some principles of material uh, welfare. And I also thought that it was interesting to bring Tocqueville here because if one asks um, you know, which are the maybe five, six most important social scientists of all times, uh, Tocqueville will probably be one of them, and he was the only one who was a Catholic. He was raised as a Catholic. He had a crisis of faith during his 20s, but later on in his life he came back to the church and he died as a good Catholic. So I think that in that sense, reading Tocqueville is something that has always been very interesting to me. Uh, my motivation was basically that we are living in this very, very rapidly changing world. When I try to motivate this to uh, my undergraduate students at Penn or to my uh, MBA students at Wharton, sometimes I even have difficulties in trying to explain to them how deeply the changes or how deep the changes that we are living right now are. It's just even difficult to, to grasp what is going on. And I think that the challenge for all of us, not only for uh, Catholics, but for all people of goodwill, is to organize a world community that satisfies two goals. The first one is to organize a just world community. I'm putting just in quotation marks because everyone knows that defining justice is actually very difficult. I'm going to follow here just as operational definition of justice what St. Thomas and later Luigi Taperelli define as an organization of society that maximizes welfare and freedom. Remember, Luigi Taperelli was a very important uh, Jesuit uh, from the 19th century in Italy. He was one of the founders of Civiltà Cattolica and very influential in Leo uh, XIII and Rerum Novarum. And the second thing that is very important for us to remember is that we would like to organize a world community that 
pays special attention to the poor and to those in need. And I separate those in need from poor because more and more in modern societies they are not necessarily the same. For instance, I'm very worried at a personal level about mental illness and there are many people in the US that suffer from mental illness, from depression and yet you can check their checking accounts and they may actually be quite wealthy and however they need help. So I'm going to offer a few thoughts and I think that in the spirit of transparency and disclaimers uh, that we were uh, putting yesterday, I should at least give you a little bit of background about my own life. So first of all, as you could probably have guessed from my first name, I'm Catholic. And the second one is I'm an academic economist, I'm a professor of economics, and I'm what I'm going to call a happy camper in mainstream economics. And I will come back to that in just one second. And that influences, of course, a lot the way I think about the world. And the third issue is I have always been very interested in uh, politics and in economic uh, policy in particular. When I was back in college, I was a rather active member of the Spanish Christian Democrat Youth Organization until I realized that I didn't have the personality or the skills to make it into politics, or I should concentrate on my mathematic skills. And over the last four years, I have been very active in the economic policy debate in Spain. And I know for a fact that our current prime minister has a soft spot in his little heart for me, where he puts, uh, you know, pins in some voodoo figure of me. <laughs> and <laughs> On Sunday, there is an op-ed being published in one major Spanish newspaper will make the Minister of Labor of Spain also have a very little spot in, in her heart for me. Anyway, uh, so what I want to argue uh, today is that in this uh, goal of trying to organize a world community that satisfies the principles of Catholic social thought and the principles that natural uh, right and natural law dictates for all people of goodwill, economics as a social science is a useful tool. And I want to do it because I think that unfortunately economics is sometimes not very well understood. I remember once uh, I was going through customs, you know, I'm a one of these dangerous uh, immigrants that destroyed the United States. And, uh, the and the immigration officer was asking me, so what are you? And I said, well, I'm an economist. And his answer at that moment was, well, I have $1,000 in my checking account. Should I buy IBM stock or should I buy Apple stock? Uh, <laughs> I don't quite remember what I replied. I hope it was not a terribly uh, silly answer. But economics is a little bit more than that. Uh, in particular, economics is a very subtle social science and sometimes it's not well understood by the public. It's also a science or let me say academic discipline more than science. So it's an academic discipline that uh, is sometimes popularized or sometimes even economists fail into the temptation of putting it in ways that really misses the points of what we are trying to say. And also it's a discipline that tends to be the bringer of bad news. Um, a very good Spanish economist say once that economists are like that extremely annoying kid that told you in second grade that Santa Claus didn't exist. Uh, so as an economist, I'm the first one who will love to have better health services. I'm the one who will love to have better health uh, education. I'm the one who would like to have better, uh, for instance, uh, help to the family, but I'm also the one who knows there is a budget. And at the end of the day, what gets inside needs to be paid out. And I'm keenly aware that if you don't respect those budgets and you don't respect the realities of constraints, you may end up in a much worse situation than you started. And that always makes you this very unpleasant guy who is saying no. And no one likes people that say no. But once we put economics as an academic discipline in its proper context, I think that the insights it provides may help us to accomplish the goals I was referring before. In particular, when someone asks me what do I think about economics, I give it a slightly different answer than what most people will be expecting. I try to emphasize that economics is not an app. It's not a program, it's an operating system. What do I mean by that? Well, economists build models. By models, we don't uh, refer to nothing more than metaphors, that very abstract representations of reality where we forget about many of the details. And I always tell my students that they need to remember two things. 
The first one is a sentence by George Box, a wonderful uh, British statistician that just died a few months ago, who said all models are false, but some are useful. Every model I write as an economist is a false model. It's false in the sense that it's not reality. It's just an abstraction, it's a metaphor that helps me to think about the world, that is going to provide me with some insights. It's like a map. No one ever confuses a map with a reality. The second thing that is very important about economic models is that it takes a model to beat another model. That apparently was originally by Zweigri Likes, an economist at Harvard, and um, a grand contributor in Chicago, and a grand contributor to econometrics. And the idea <coughs> is that just by saying that you, know, you have some way to think, let's suppose, about monetary policy, and that you don't like it, that's not very productive. That you need to bring something better to uh, beat uh, what is going on. And in that sense, one really wants to think about economics not as a list of concrete models, like the neoclassical growth model or the real business cycle model. One wants to think about economics as a list of instructions about how to build models. Okay? And what are the list of instructions that the academic community of economists have agreed is a good way to think about uh, the world. Well, basically, uh, there are three commands in this operating system. The first command is that agents have preferences. Uh, that agents have preferences means that when the flight attendant will come tonight when I'm flying back to Philadelphia and will ask me chicken or pasta, I will have some preference for chicken over pasta, let's say chicken. But it doesn't mean that I'm selfish. It doesn't mean, for instance, imagine I'm flying with a friend and I know that my friend really, really likes chicken and that we are at the back of the plane, so there is no more chicken left. And I'm going to ask pasta because I prefer me getting pasta and him getting chicken than me getting chicken over pasta. Okay? So preferences is also, I have a preference for Spain being a prosperous country. I have a preference for Spain having low unemployment. I have a preference from development in Africa. The second thing that economists do is they assume that people are going to do something about those preferences. That when the flight attendant comes and asks me if I want chicken or pasta, I will probably say chicken if I like chicken more than pasta. Okay, we don't always assume that we are not going to make mistakes. You know, sometimes the flight attendant comes, you are reading the newspaper, you don't know what you are saying and you make mistakes. But basically the second point is that we are going to do something based on those preferences. And the third thing is that the actions of all these economic agents in society making decisions based on their preferences is going to give an outcome. These three things, we usually call them in economics, utility function, maximization and equilibrium. The problem of these three words is that they are used in a very precise sense in economics that many times has very little to do with the concepts of a utility, maximization, or equilibrium that we use in day-to-day -day language. And many of the confusions about what economics is about is because people are trying to read into those words things that are not really there in the very concrete technical sense. And I always make the joke to my students that I would love to, I would love to substitute these three words with completely random made-up words so people will not confuse them anymore. I don't know, just call them 2b1, 2b2, and 2b3. Okay? In particular, there are figures of speech like the homo economicus that are sometimes used to criticize economics, which are not, I think, really a very good representation of what economists do in day to day. Okay? And in particular, uh, what these days we are really trying to think is about very general situations where agents do not need to be engaged, for instance, in market actions, it can be non-market actions, where agents are trying to maximize preferences defined over very general sets of outcomes, which does not need to do anything about uh, uh, personal selfish interest. And yes, while economists tend to have an appreciation for markets that is bigger than the appreciation for markets of other non-academics, we are also very keenly aware that markets are not perfect. And you know that figure of the fundamentalist economist who believes in uh, markets above anything else is probably more a figment of the imagination of a few than the actual reality. What happens is that as economists, we are, we are also keenly aware that governments fail. 
and that many times the market is not perfect, has many problems, but that the solutions by the government are only going to do things even worse. Okay, so the beautiful thing about this operating system of economics I was mentioning is that one really can use it to think about many, many issues that go well beyond should I buy IBM or Apple, as my immigration officer was concerned about. In particular, in the last 10, 15 years, there has been a huge literature of economists using the tools of economics, thinking about issues like culture. How does culture come? How does it evolve? Uh, Cardinal George was asking us, was telling us about language. There is a literature in economics about language transmission, of course, my native language is Spanish. Well, it turns out to be the case that the native language of my father is not. He made a conscious decision to teach me Spanish as my native language. Why did he do that? Why were the incentives he had to do that? Um, networks. Cardinal George was emphasizing the importance of relations. There's a huge literature these days on social networks. Absolutely beautiful and gorgeous literature on social networks. Uh, gift giving, identity. Just let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, if you go to an economist uh, office, you will see a lot of times a big row of books that say handbook of economics. If you made it into the handbook, it means you are canonical, in the sense of canonical, in, you know, canon. And this is, for instance, the handbook of social economics by Jess Ben Habib, Alberto Vicin, and Matthew Jackson. Uh, these uh, three professors are accomplished scholars, as you can get. Matt Jackson is as high in the profession as anyone can imagine. And he does social networks, he does culture, he does social norms. Um, this book is called Identity Economics, and it's about, uh, by George Akerlof and Rachel Cranton. Uh, George Akerlof is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. It's about trying to use the tools of economics to think about how people build their own identities. Why do I think myself as a Spaniard? Why do people think of, of themselves as African-Americans? Why do people think of themselves as belonging to a, to, a, to a religion? And why is this so important? Well, this is so important because once we use these tools of economics, we can really start to apply it to policy questions that are, I think, very, very relevant. I'm going to talk about my own research uh, because of two reasons. First of all, because uh, Joe yesterday told us that this is the best possible discussion that we can do. And second, <laughs> more importantly, because I understand it a little bit better. So I have some research on trying to understand the sexual activity of teenagers. This is very important because sexual activity by teenagers leads to pregnancies. And we know that teen pregnancies tend to uh, imply very bad life outcomes. Uh, the mothers will not complete education, they will have, usually they will never marry or they will have very short marriages, the kids will be raised in broken families with poor education, and we really want, I think, or most of us will love to see situations where these teen pregnancies do not occur. At the same time, and as I was saying before, I'm Catholic, I think that the policy solutions I want to have uh, are solutions that need to respect the culture of life. So we need to do things that are fully compatible with the teachings of the Catholic Church and yet achieve these goals of trying to reduce uh, teenage pregnancies. And what I did in my research was trying to understand the role of parent socialization, of you know, the time you spend with your daughter and you sit with her and you explain to her the importance of the proper use of human sexuality versus the importance of your peers, of you know, your friends in high school telling you, hey, come on, this is going to be fun, let's go for a beer and let's see what happened later. Okay? So you go to the data, you try to find the networks of people. What we did, there is a very good data set where uh, uh, teenagers in uh, California high schools are asked about their friends. We identified who their friends were, we identified uh, who uh, their social network was, who was engaging in sexual relations within that uh, social network. We identify, we try to identify how much socialization was done by the parents, and we had an empirical model where we try to think about these issues. Now, it's a very good paper, you know, it's a brand. Well, it's okay, I mean, we got it published, but at least it shows that you can use the tools of modern economics to think about these issues, and potentially this may help us to design good economic policies. And I, th I really think this is not what most people will have in mind, generally, when they speak about economics. And um, as you can see, I have many, many more slides uh, to talk about 
I was planning to talk a, a little bit about the uh, social market economy and how economics help us to think about uh, the challenges that the welfare state suffers right now, both in Europe and in the United States. But in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here. I will be more than glad uh, to talk about all this later. Uh, a few uh, weeks ago, I gave a talk in a conference and Mark Aguiar, a professor of Princeton, asked me before the talk, are you going to make a reference to music? I, I'm a big music lover. And I said, yes, don't worry, I will make a reference to music because in every of my presentations there needs to be a reference to music. And the reference to be today is going to be to Olivier Messiaen. I don't know how many of you love uh, Olivier Messiaen. He was a wonderful French composer from the 20th century. Uh, deeply Catholic, some of his uh, works I think are some of the most deeply Catholic music works of the 20th century and in particular he has an absolutely gorgeous fantastic opera called Saint Francis about the life of uh, Saint Francis of Assisi and what I really admire about Messiaen more than the beauty of his music even is his ability to combine the best of the Catholic tradition of spiritual music with the best of modern music. His music from a technical point of view uh, incorporates the absolute best of the atonality revolution of the 1920s and it is just a product that is absolutely amazing I'm constantly listening to it in my office at Penn and what I think we should at least as an economist what I would like to do is strive to be a little bit like Olivier Messiaen and trying to use the best possible techniques of the modern world in this case from the academic discipline of economics to help to build a little bit of a better world community. Thank you.